Good morning and welcome to Ionis Pharmaceuticals Second Quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Dave Nakasona, Investor Relations, to lead off the call. Please begin. Thank you, Debbie. Before we begin, I encourage everyone to go to the investor section of the IONIS website to find the press release and related financial tables, including a reconciliation of the GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures that we will discuss today. We believe non-GAAP financial results better represent the economics of our business and how we manage our business. We've also posted slides on our website that accompany our discussion today. With me on today's call are Brett Monia, Chief Executive Officer, Beth Haugen, Chief Financial Officer, and Richard Geary, Executive Vice President of Development. And joining us for Q&A, Vanessa Cataray, Chief Corporate Development and Commercial Officer, and Eric Swayze, Executive Vice President of Research. I would like to draw your attention to slide three, which contains our forward-looking language statement. We will be making forward-looking statements, which are based on our current expectations and beliefs. These statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may differ materially. I encourage you to consult the risk factors discussed in our SEC filings for additional detail. With that, I'll turn the call over to Brett. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on today's call. Last year, when I took on my new role as CEO of IONIS, I put forth a plan intended to bring substantially greater success to IONIS and substantially greater value for all stakeholders. This plan was to leverage our well-established foundation of scientific innovation by focusing on three strategic objectives. First, to evolve our business model, to include commercializing products of our own. This includes building the necessary capabilities to prepare for multiple IONIS commercial launches. Second, to expand our drug discovery capabilities through new initiatives to enhance our technology. And third, to significantly advance and grow our late-stage pipeline to ensure for a substantial increase in the number of new products reaching the market in the near and longer term. So now let's see how we're progressing against these three strategic goals for this year. The IONIS wholly owned pipeline is advancing on track and growing significantly. Last week, we reached full enrollment in the neurotransform study of Eplontercin for the treatment of patients with polyneuropathy. With this study now fully enrolled and on track for data by mid-2022, this medicine is one important step closer to reaching the market. We are also developing epilontericin for the treatment of cardiomyopathy in the phase three cardio transform study, which continues to enroll well. Our phase three study involving our APOC3 Lyca medicine in patients with FCS is enrolling in schedule, and our, plan and our second phase three study for APOC3 Lyca is on track to begin later this year in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia, a much larger patient population. Our phase three study for ION363 in patients with a genetic form of ALS due to mutations in the FUS gene is also progressing well. Furthermore, we look forward to initiating a phase three study for our PKK Lyca medicine in patients with hereditary angioedema late this year or early next year. And as our wholly owned pipeline advances, we're also making great progress in building out our commercial capabilities and our strategy. Our acquisition of Axia was a key step in advancing our commercial strategy and building these capabilities. We have now completed the integration of XC with an IONIS, and we're pleased with the progress being made in our SOBI partnership for the distribution of Texeti and Waylivera in Europe and North America. As a reminder, we established this partnership to continue providing these important medicines to patients while we focus on Epon Pearson and APOC3 Lyca. We have also made significant additional progress this year against our strategic objective to expand the reach of our drug discovery capabilities through new investments to enhance our technology. Our efforts include broadening our internal technology initiatives as well as in licensing new technology. We recently announced a new partnership with Bicycle Therapeutics for exclusive access to Bicycle's proprietary platform chemistry for oligonucleotide drugs focused primarily on targeted delivery to skeletal and cardiac muscle. 
This collaboration complements our significant internal efforts, as well as the progress we're making under our Arrow Therapeutics and Genuity Sciences collaborations, all of which potentially enables us to significantly expand the reach of our technology. And lastly, we're making great progress this year in achieving our third strategic objective to have 12 or more marketed products in, in 2026. In addition to completing enrollment in the Epsilon Terrison Neurotransform study, we also recently achieved key phase three milestones with Topherson and Pelicarson. All three of these significant milestones move these programs closer to reaching the market and highlight the excellent progress we're making across our late stage pipeline. Biogen completed the placebo controlled treatment portion of the phase three Valor study of Topherson, data expected by this fall is now offering Topherson to SOD1 ALS patients on an individual compassionate use basis. If the phase three valor results are successful, Topherson could become the first ever disease modifying therapy for a genetic cause of ALS and our next commercial product. And this week, we announced achievement of a key enrollment milestone in the LP little a horizon phase three study for telecarcin in patients with LP little a driven cardiovascular disease. As we announced, we have now achieved enrollment of nearly 4,000 patients in this cardiovascular outcome trial, representing 50% of our target enrollment goal for the study. This achievement, along with the substantial progress we're making across all of our mid and late stage LICA programs, demonstrates the consistently attractive profile for all our LICA medicines in development today. So in wrapping up my opening comments, we are very pleased with the progress we're making to achieve all our strategic objectives. We've made great progress this year, and we are looking forward to an exciting second half of the year as we focus further on executing on our strategy and achieving the goals that lie ahead. And importantly, we are well positioned for growth with the people and the financial strength to achieve all of this and more. And with that, I'll now turn the call over to Beth to review our financial results. Then Richard will discuss recent pipeline updates and preview key pipeline catalysts expected for the remainder of the year. After Richard, I'll wrap up our prepared remarks before taking your questions. Now over to Beth. Thank you, Brad. Our financial results for the first half of this year reflect our commitment to invest to drive future growth. We earned nearly $240 million in revenue and recognized $312 million in non-GAAP operating expenses, resulting in a non-GAAP net loss of $81 million. These results were in line with our expectations and reflect the multiple steps we have already taken this year in support of our strategic objectives. We've completed the integration of Axia, entered distribution arrangements with SOBI, and restructured our commercial operations. In our first quarter earnings call, we projected realizing substantial savings from the Exia and SOBI transactions. I'm pleased to say we are on track to realize more than $50 million of savings this year. We are putting these savings to work by reinvesting them to drive future growth. That means investing in three key areas, advancing and expanding our wholly owned pipeline, building our commercial capabilities, and enhancing our technology. I'll provide more details about the investments we've made so far this year when I talk about our operating expenses. But first, I'll provide additional details on our revenue. In the first half of this year, Finraza continued its blockbuster performance, achieving over $1 billion in global sales. We earned over $130 million in royalty revenue, virtually all falling to our bottom line as profit. And based on Finraza's net sales, we reached the highest royalty tier in the second quarter. We are pleased with Biogen's continued efforts to build upon Spinraza's proven profile of long-term safety and efficacy in SMA patients of all ages. Biogen recently reported new data reinforcing the potential for improved outcomes in patients treated with a higher dose of Spinraza, which is being evaluated in the DeVos study. And in the response study, Biogen is continuing to evaluate Spinraza's potential to benefit patients previously treated with gene therapy. Together with the substantial and growing body of evidence supporting Spinraza's proven profile, 
and over 60,000 SMA patients. We believe Spinraza will continue to be the market-leading treatment for SMA patients of all ages. In the first half of this year, TechSeti and WeLiver generated revenues of $31 million. And also in the first half, we completed the transition of our commercial operations to SOBI and recognized our first full quarter of TechSeti and WeLiver revenues from distribution fees based on net sales. As a reminder, we included this shift in revenue in our 2021 revenue guidance. We also earned nearly, nearly $70 million in R&D revenues in the first half, including $10 million for Bi from Biogen for advancing ION 541, which is in development for patients with ALS with no known genetic history of the disease. More than 85% of our R&D revenue was from medicines in our leading cardiometabolic and neurology franchises. Our R&D revenues included revenue from numerous partners, as together we advanced more than 10 programs. Our ability to generate revenue from numerous diverse sources is a key element of our financial strength. We reported non-GAAP operating expenses of $312 million in the first half of this year. This was a slight increase compared to last year and was in line with our expectations. R&D expenses increased by 20% compared to last year, driven primarily by the f one tercin and APOC3 LICA phase three studies and costs associated with our wholly owned program. We also incurred expenses associated with our genuity collaboration to identify novel targets. These increases reflect two of our key areas of investment, our wholly owned pipeline and our technology. SG&A expenses decreased by approximately 25% compared to last year due to cost efficiencies realized from integrating Axia and restructuring our commercial operations. Based on our first half results and our projection for increased R&D revenues from our advancing partnered program in the second half of this year, we are reaffirming our 2021 revenue guidance of more than $600 million. Already in the third quarter, we have earned a $25 million milestone payment from Novartis for achieving 50% enrollment in the phase three study of Pella Carson. We expect our operating expenses to continue to increase in the second half of this year as we advance our ongoing phase three studies for Eplon Tercin, Ionis A plus C3 Lyca, and our FUS ALS medicine. Our operating expenses will also increase as we get the phase three study underway for APOC3 LICA in patients with severe high triglycerides and potentially start the phase three study for PKK LICA. And we are investing to enhance our technology, ensuring that our platform remains innovative and competitive. As Brett mentioned, we recently entered into a license agreement with Bicycle Therapeutics for a $45 million upfront payment. We did not include this license fee in our original financial guidance. And for that reason alone, we are revising our 2021 operating expense and net loss guidance. We now project operating expenses in the range of $710 million to $750 million and a net loss of less than $110 million assuming the low end of expenses and all on a non-GAAP basis. And because of our, our projected increasing R&D revenue in the second half of this year, we expect our net loss will be lower in the second half of this year compared to the first half. With the important steps we have already taken this year and more than $2 billion of cash and investment, we believe we are well positioned for accelerated growth. We look forward to continuing to invest in our pipeline and technology and to moving more medicines toward the market to achieve our goal of 12 or more marketed products in 2026. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Richard. Thank you, Beth. As Brett described earlier, we're certainly pleased with the excellent performance across our pipeline in the first half of this year. With the achievement of key phase three catalysts with Topherson, Eplon Tercin, and Pelicarson, these medicines are now closer to reaching the market. These catalysts also position us well to deliver our regular cadence of phase three data readouts, beginning with Topherson, uh, expected by this fall. 
Tofacin is now one step closer to becoming the first genetically targeted therapy for the treatment of ALS and to becoming Iona's next commercial product. Biogen recently began offering Tofacin to SOD1 ALS patients on an individual compassionate use basis with plans to broaden this access once the data are reported. Biogen is also conducting the ATLAS study to investigate Tofacin's potential to prevent or delay disease onset in presymptomatic SOD1 ALS patients. The rationale for ATLAS is similar to Spinraza Nurture study, which has enabled infants who began treatment prior to SMA symptom onset to develop more like non-SMA children. After Tofersen, the next program on track to read out is the neuro T transform study of Eplon Tersen for the treatment of TTR polyneuropathy. With enrollment in this study now complete, we expect data by the middle of next week, next year. Nice. As a result, we're positioned to file for marketing authorization for Eplon Tersen in patients with TTR polyneuropathy by the end of next year, assuming the data are positive. Up next, we expect balance, the balance study of Iona's APOC3 LICA in patients with FCS to read out in 2023. We're on track to initiate a second phase three study of Iona's APOC3 LICA in patients with severe high triglycerides in the second half of this year, which positions this program for data in 2024. Also in 2024, we anticipate phase three data from the LPA Horizon outcome study of Pelicarson, the cardio T transform study of Eplon Tersen, and the pivotal study in patients with FUS ALS. In addition to our deep late stage pipeline, we have a large mid-stage pipeline that we expect to continue to support additional phase three starts. Many of these mid-stage programs have read out data recently or have upcoming data readouts that if positive position these medicines to move into the next stage of development. Data we presented at AAIC last week demonstrated that monthly and quarterly dosing with Ionis MAP TRX achieved substantial, durable, and dose dependent reductions in all forms of CSF tau with generally favorable safety and tolerability in Alzheimer's disease patients. Based on these results, Biogen plans to advance Ionis. MAP TRX into a larger phase two study to more fully test our antisense medicine as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Coming up in the second half of this year, we expect data from Buprenorsen phase 2B study in patients with dyslipidemia and cardiovascular disease. We look forward to starting our phase 1-2 study of ION582 for the treatment of patients with Angelman syndrome. And later this year, we look forward to reporting additional data from the phase two study of Iona's PKK LICA in patients with hereditary angioedema. We also look forward to initiating our phase three study with this medicine, which is on track late this year, or early next year. And our partner Bayer is continuing to make good progress in the phase two B study of Iona's factor 11 LRX in patients with end stage renal disease putting this study on track for data in the first half of next year. As the year unfolds, we look forward to providing future updates as the pipeline continues to advance and we achieve additional catalysts from across the pipeline, which together move us closer to achieving our goal of 12 or more marketed medicines in 2026. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Brett to close this portion of our call. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. In the first half of the year, we continue to successfully advance all our key strategic objectives. We have made great progress in evolving our business model, building our commercial capabilities, and preparing for multiple IONIS commercial launches. We have made significant progress in advancing our technology to expand our drug discovery capabilities. And with the progress we've made across our pipeline, including achieving key phase three milestones which move Tofersen, Eplontersen, and Pelicarsen closer to the market, we are very well positioned to achieve our goal of delivering a substantial number of new products to the market in the near and the long term. In the second half of the year, shaping up 
be even more successful with several new key clinical trial initiations and clinical readouts, including results of the phase three Valor study in patients with SOD1 ALS by this fall. And importantly, we have the resources and people we need to invest in all our strategic priorities, positioning us for accelerated growth and to help ensure great success for Ionis for many years to come. And with that, I'll now open, open the call for, for uh, questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our roster. The first question comes from Jason Gerbery with Bank of America. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hey, uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, yeah, a couple for me, just maybe, can, can you help set the expectation into the uh, phase 2B for buprenorphine? Just, just sort of curious, you know, the, the high end men need uh, subgroup of patients with more severe uh, triglyceride levels. Just wondering your thoughts in terms of the ability to read across from this study to that uh, patient population. And then I guess just secondarily, um, you know, have you given any thought to Huntington's disease and potentially next steps to revisiting that um, as a category? Just curious your latest thoughts on Huntington's. Thanks. Sure, Jason. Uh, thanks for the question. So uh, for buprenorphine, the, the phase 2B study, uh, which is um, Pfizer has said that they plan to have top line data announced this year, uh, as a reminder, is in patients with um, um, high non-HDL cholesterol and high triglycerides. And this is the patient population that, if they move to phase three, which is the plan, um, that they're targeting for a phase three, um, uh, for, for a phase three program. Um, uh, the unmet medical need uh, for, for uh, remnant cholesterol combined with high triglycerides, uh, mixed dyslipidemias, if you will, is very significant. A very large patient population, um, and um, and one that positions buprenorphine um, to target mixed dyslipidemias quite nicely. Um, uh, you know, there we're also in addition to buprenorphine, we're very excited about our APOC3 like a drug that we're moving into phase three for severe high, high triglycerides as well. We think that this mechanism is the best mechanism, best in class strategy for patients suffering purely from high triglyceride related diseases, which affects millions of people. So I, I raise that because it's important to, to realize that buprenorphine and, and our APOC3 Lyca medicine are targeting very large patient populations and distinct populations that have some overlap, but they really are quite distinct um, uh, for that. And I could touch on Huntington, but first I'd like to just see if Richard wanted to add anything to what I said. Um, no, I think you, you covered it well, Brad. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Um, as for as uh, um, Huntington, um, as Roche has said, Jason, um, uh, they're, they continue to analyze all the data and, they're, and they've um, promised a, an update on the, the results of, that they, of the study as they go through more data, as well as next steps by the end of the year. We're working very closely um, with, with Roche on this. Um, and um, so stay tuned for, for the second half of the year for an update. All right, great, thanks. The next question is from Luca Issy with RBC. Please go ahead. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much for uh, taking my question. Congrats on all the progress. Two quick one on the uh, pipeline. So maybe the first on TTR, Richard. Um, can you expand a little bit more on the interim analysis that you're planning for TTR Lyca in mid-2022 for polyneuropathy? It looks to me that the interim analysis is almost eight months, actually. It's actually eight months ahead of the primary endpoint. So wondering what gives you confidence that with such a short follow-up, you're going to be able to uh, see a separation of the curves. And then the second question is on ENAC, wondering if you can provide any update there. We've seen Arrowhead also running into safety issues there. Uh, so any thoughts on whether uh, the safety issues that they have had are similar to the one that you saw? And maybe bigger picture if you can comment on what's next for the respiratory franchise. Thanks. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll take that Eplon Turson question for you first. Our confidence, of course, derives from the first um, polyneuropathy study we ran with TechSETI. Same mechanism of action. Um, we believe we have a, a much safer drug and a, a much uh, well tolerated drug with once monthly uh, administration. But at eight months with TechSETI in that trial, we had statistically significant improvements in our endpoints. And, and so it was already separating from placebo quite nicely uh, at that time point. So we believe that that uh, gives us that kind of confidence that we need in, in going into this uh, interim analysis. In fact, it's quite high. I think this, the, the second question that you had, um, we, you know, I can't even speak to what might be happening with the competition. We had a preclinical issue. Uh, we're working through that, and we're very confident that we'll be able to. Yeah, the finish line, yeah. And if I could just add um, to what Richard said, thank you, Richard, is um, on Eplon Terrison, uh, also um, what gives us great confidence, not only the fact that TechSETI showed statistically significant benefit in the same primary endpoints in the phase three study that was conducted for that drug at eight months, Eplon Terrison is showing even greater TTR reductions. We're, 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 we're uh, at around 90% reductions based at the dose we're using in phase three um, uh, with excellent safety tolerability as like for all of our like as, as Richard mentioned. So we're, we're very confident in that outcome. And we also have a, uh, have, we're very comfortable with the regulatory path forward as well. Um, and just to add on the pulmonary, we're working um, and we're making really good progress uh, preclinically and looking at new designs, new molecules that can um, uh, move the pulmonary program back to development in the future. So stay tuned for that. Um, we'll talk more about that in maybe at the end of the year or, or next year. Super, thanks so much. The next question is from uh, Yaren Werber with um, Cow Cowan. Please go ahead. Hi, congrats to team on all the progress. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. This is Brendan on for your own. Um, just a couple of quick ones from us. Um, so I know you mentioned that you're looking to initiate the phase three HAE study by the end of the year or early next year. Um, kind of just wanted to see what steps are left there. Uh, if you already have alignment with FDA on the study design and it's kind of just logistics and getting it set up at this point, or, or are you still finalizing the study? Um, and then really quickly for Angelman, I uh, wanted to see if we might get any preclinical data from that at, this, at any point this year um, and what you might be able to tell us about timing and maybe trial design for the phase one, too. Uh, thanks very much. Sure thing. Um, I'll take the HAE and then um, I'll, I'll ask Eric to talk a little bit about what we um, presented and published on in the Angelman program after that. So. Uh, preclinically. So for HAE, uh, we're putting final touches on the phase three study design. Uh, we're having very good um, uh, discussions with, with regulators. Um, really, it's mostly logistics, uh, Brendan. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're getting um, drug made. We're getting, we're preparing for the phase three uh, design, getting, uh, selecting our sites, moving forward for activation of sites. It's just blocking and tackling, honestly, at this point. Um, to get that study up and running. We're hoping it's a stretch goal to get it done and initiated by the end of the year. Um, but certainly uh, we see it happening no later than the first quarter of next year. And when we, when we share the full uh, data set um, in the second half of the year for our phase two study, we also plan to, to share our strategy, our development strategy, what our, what our phase three design looks like and why, why we think it will position uh, PKK Leica um, potentially as the best in class molecule for HAE. So stay tuned for that in the second half. We got a lot, a lot, of, a lot of momentum going into the second half of the year and a lot of exciting news coming out, as we think, in the second half. Eric, um, we've published on Angelman's. Yeah, we have. Um, we were actually the, the first to elucidate the mechanism in collaboration with our academic colleagues uh, that you can inhibit an antisense transcript and upregulate EBE3A, which is the deficient uh, protein in, in Angelman syndrome. Um, then we spent a, a good amount of time trying to optimize the drug and find the ideal human development candidate. Um, it took us a little bit longer than, than I'd hoped, but uh, 
we've got a great looking molecule and are looking forward to getting that started in the first in human study later this year. Um, took everything we learned about how to make uh, great neurology drugs from our extensive experience and tried to make a molecule that we are, we're hopeful will be best in class in, in this space and provide a great benefit to patients with angiomas. And the um, first inpatient study, the phase one, two study, will be focused obviously on safety tolerability, dose escalation, select dose, um, based on biomarker readouts for a um, potentially for a phase three study to follow. Got it. Thanks, guys. The next question is from Yanan Zhu with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thanks for taking my questions, uh, and congrats on the progress. Uh, a lot of uh, things going on. Um, I have uh, one question on the technology platform front uh, with regard to bicycle uh, collaboration. Um, so have you compared their bicyclic uh, peptide uh, approach targeting uh, uh, transferring receptor uh, with uh, uh, the approaches uh, of using either for monoclonal antibodies or antibody fabs, and uh, also uh, given uh, your um, uh, prior experience with uh, uh, myotonic dystrophy uh, in clinical studies, um, when you look at the data, uh, the, when you were doing your diligence. Do you feel there is enough uh, fold increase in muscle exposure uh, compared with uh, unlabeled antisense that gives you confidence that you could um, perhaps uh, restart the myotonic dystrophy program and uh, have an accelerated uh, path? Um, uh, yeah, so, so that's the first question. Thanks, Yan, and we're, we're really excited about the advances we're making in targeted delivery across the board, including bicycles. Um, Eric, um, and, and the answer is yes, we've done comparatives, quite a bit of comparative work prior to um, completing the bicycle deal. Eric's, uh, Eric left, um, led that effort with his team, and so I'll turn it over to him to, to tell you why we're so excited about bicycle and what our, how we believe we differentiate from other approaches. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brett. Um, so we absolutely have compared it with uh, other, other transparent receptor uh, ligands. So we, we were involved in this space uh, reasonably early on, and it extensively looked at how monoclonal antibodies and FABs uh, that target transferrin receptor 1 can deliver cargos to, to the muscle. And we, we, we definitely demonstrated that, that that can happen, and we're interested in trying to find better ligands that, that we thought would make better uh, drugs in the end. And that ultimately led us to uh, Bicycle, which has these very unique bicyclic peptides that have been able to, where they've been able to develop high affinity ligands for multiple proteins and transferrin receptor one in particular. We absolutely compared the, the bicycle oligoconjugates to the fabs and found them to, to be essentially identical in terms of the potency based on the amount of oligonucleotide that would be delivered. And, and the key advantage here is the size. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are big, bicyclic peptides are small. There's probably a 50 to 75 fold difference in weight. And that translates directly to less total drug that would have to be administered if you scale it up to a human dose projection because oligos are reasonably small and the bicycles are smaller. And so we think that'll be a, a large advantage with this technology if we can make it work and make uh, hope, hopefully best in class muscle and cardiac targeting uh, antisense drugs. As, as to the programs, uh, you alluded to, to DMPK and DM1. Yes, we needed more potency in that program. And this is what the bicyclic uh, transfer and receptor one targeting technology does for us. Uh, we think that it certainly has the potency enhancement to, to get us in, in the range of what we need clinically. Um, and beyond that, we're, we're not really prepared to comment exactly on what targets uh, will advance or the timing, but we have a whole host of of neuromuscular and cardio, cardiac targets lined up that we think are great for this technology and are anxious to get it moving. Great, uh, thanks for all those uh, color. Uh, and then a quick question on tau lowering or the MAP uh, T program. Uh, you showed us uh, some pr uh, very impressive reductions of tau. How should we think about this, this approach 
uh, compared with, uh, for example, antibody approach targeting tau. Um, and it could, could there be um, a, a kind of biomarker uh, path forward uh, with this, uh, this approach, given the recent development with the A beta approach? Thanks. Yeah, so as to the path forward, um, Biogen said they plan to advance uh, this into a larger phase two study to, to, to more fully test the, the clinical outcomes and, and clinical benefits associated with, with tau lowering. Um, so that's the, the strategy clinically. Uh, as far as a comparison of the antisense approach to an antibody approach, uh, I, I really think there is no comparison. Uh, tau is an intracellular protein. It's known to accumulate and ag aggregate inside the cells. And that's where our, our drugs work. So they turn off the translation and creation and synthesis of the tau protein by binding to and degrading the RNA. So we turn off all forms of tau, and that's what we demonstrated in the clinical trial, that, that all forms of tau are reduced. To reduce tau in the CSF, it, by our mechanism, it has to be reduced inside the cell because that's where it comes from, whereas antibodies you know, you have a, a, a macromolecule that has a small penetration into the, into the CNS space, and in the CSF, it binds to the, the tau protein and reduces it only in the CSF. And we don't think those antibodies can engage tau productively inside of a cell, which is what our drugs are doing, and we think that's where the key pathology of tau is occurring, and that you need to lower tau throughout the brain in all cell populations. And we're very encouraged about our drug, and uh, we think it's uh, the, 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 one of the key things to test the, the tau-lowering hypothesis in AD, and we think it's a great one to test, and we're excited that Biogen's taking it forward to, to do exactly that. Great. Very helpful. Thanks for all the color. Thanks, Yanni. The next question is from Paul Matteis with Stiffel. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking our question. This is Alex on for Paul. Uh, actually, a follow-up on, on MAP-T. I was wondering, um, from the phase uh, one, two, if you could comment on the relative ASO doses versus uh, in Tomonersen phase three. And then secondarily, curious if, if there were any uh, biomarkers or, or VMRI sort of uh, measures in this study, and, and if you could comment on that or if you expect that this to get published or presented in the future. Thanks. Um, Sure. I, I, you know, the doses weren't disclosed in, in that poster. We are working on getting uh, our, our phase one data published, and, and so stay tuned for that, and hopefully we can share more information about it. I, I will say that uh, this is a, a, a pretty good oligo, and we've been working hard on making advances in how, how we design and identify oligos and subtle tweaks to, to the chemistry and the design of the compounds. And so we've been able to make them more and more potent over the years. And I think our PKPD modelers have done a fantastic job predicting the human doses. And we think this, is, this represents one of, the, one of the better molecules we made. and It, it performed as expected. So uh, hopefully we can share more data in, in, in a publication soon. And can you just say whether or not there were biomarker data taken in this study, or is that not something that was done beyond uh, well, the so we, we, we had a range of, of biomarkers and, and outcomes in, in the study. Um, I can't comment beyond what we reported in, in terms of, of MAP-T lowering. Right. Good. Great. Thanks. The next question is from Yale Jen with Laidlow and Company. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thanks for taking the question. Uh, this may be a little bit forward-looking that uh, uh, in terms of the Apple uh, loan person, if you get approved uh, maybe in 2023, uh, the question is that uh, after you uh, integrate the CIA uh, uh, operations, what's the future sort of commercial uh, infrastructure or strategy you have? Uh, should that be the case and that this will be your next uh, product to launch? Thanks, Yale. Um, I'll ask Vanessa to talk a little um, to, to um, talk about our Epon Person program. Why we're so excited about it? Not just for the polyneuropathy 23, but also why we're excited about this program as a potential best in class for um, cardiomyopathy as well. Vanessa, are you on? I am. Um, <clears throat> yes, happy to uh, talk about our program and our commercial launches. So. 
we are absolutely building the capabilities to prepare markets for IONIS commercial launches, and you are right, this would be um, one of the first ones um, that we would bring to market. Um, it is, as Brett said, um, you know, um, a foundational treatment, best in class for both PN and cardiomyopathy. Uh, we expect um, to see proven benefit in neuropathy, quality of life, you know, a, a very favorable safety profile, and optimal self-administration and at-home dosing. Um, so um, we're very excited about uh, moving this um, program forward. There is a um, brand team that's been formed around it, and they're preparing um, the markets for launches as well. On cardiomyopathy, um, as well as the second indication, it is important to you know remember that is um, where we have the largest trial in CM. We have about 750 patients that we're recruiting, and we are conducting this trial to generate just a robust set of clinical data. Um, we're excited about this program um, as the second indication for a person because it's going to be really the breadth of data and the diversity of data that it's going to provide for clinicians on how a blunt person can be used uh, in a very dynamic market, right, with or without standard of care uh, is going to be um, really um, uh, an advantageous place um, for a blunt person overall. So um, really um, good, um, good program, uh, great indications, and again, uh, looking for foundational treatment as best in class for both PN and CM. Okay, great. That's very, very helpful. Maybe just one more question here which is that uh, you will have the acromegaly data readout uh, the second half of this year. Uh, could you recap a little bit of this program and uh, what sort of expectation uh, you guys may have? And thanks. Sure thing, Yale. So um, uh, we're, um, as you said, we're, we're planning to um, share the results of the phase two um, study for our growth hormone receptor lycomedicine in acromegaly patients who are poorly controlled on top of, um, despite the fact that they're taking somatostatin analog. So this is on top of somatostatin analog um, in that study. And the data that we plan to sh share um, <coughs> is um, in the second half of the year will include also um, open label extension data, which we think is important to um, characterize the long-term profile. Uh, for growth hormone receptor like a, um, in, in this patient population. So um, we will be presenting data on target engagement, growth hormone binding, um, safety tolerability, uh, impact on IGF-1, and also patient reported outcomes and other measures of, of how patients are feeling with this, with this disease um, in, in, the, in this readout. You know, we're, we're, we haven't identified the venue um, or, or the, the, the way in which we'll present the data or get the data out in the second half of the year. We're still working on that, but we, we will get it out the second half of the year. We're still analyzing quite a bit of the open label extension data. And as I said, I, we think that that's quite important to include. Um, and as a reminder, uh, this is one study of a program uh, for this drug. We also have the uh, phase two study for GHR like uh, in patients uh, frontline monotherapy in, in patients with acromegaly. And that study is expected to read out next year. So we're positioning this drug potentially as a treatment for patients who are poorly controlled with standard of care as well as potentially frontline, depending on how the data reads out. Okay, great. That's very helpful. And uh, congrats on the, all the progress. Thank you. The next question is from Jessica Fai with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey guys, um, two quick questions on uh, Toberson. What read across to the rest of your neuro pipeline do you think investors can and cannot make based on the upcoming phase three results? And Second one related to that product. Uh, can you talk about the reason why the compassionate use is currently restricted to those patients with the most rapidly progressing disease? Thanks. Sure thing, Jess. Uh, thanks for the question. So <clears throat> um, we're very much looking forward, as, as of course you know, to the phase three readout for Toperson and Sovereign LS. As we said in the in our presentation. This has the potential to be the very first disease-modifying 
treatment for a genetic cause of ALS, really any cause of ALS, really, when you look at it. Um, so we're excited about it. Um, the read-through is significant, um, if positive. It, it will be another demonstration um, of, you know, what we believe is the leading platform for the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases um, of any. When you look at the size of our pipeline, it'll be a further confirmation that not only um, can we engage targets that cause, that are at the root cause of these diseases in neuro, as we've done for over six, seven, eight programs to date, that we can hit these targets well, that the safety and the tolerability um, is attractive, and that we can provide clinical benefit um, in, in, um, in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. So we think that this has significant read-through um, in two ways. One, to the rest of our ALS platform, right? Um, it will demonstrate that this platform, our, our strategy to target ALS, works. And it bodes very well for two other genetically caused forms of ALS, our C9 ORF program, which is due to read out phase two, read out next year, and our FUS genetic, uh, genetic uh, ALS due to FUS mutations, um, which is um, in phase three development. And we believe it also has significant read through to the broad ALS population that has no known genetic cause. Our ATAX and two program, and also beyond that, uh, for neuro in general. I mean, it demonstrates we can all the things I already said about target engagement and tolerability, and also that we can penetrate uh, key regions within the CNS and um, and provide meaningful, hopefully meaningful clinical benefit to to, to patients. As for compassionate use, that's really a question for. Biogen, I, I really not want to get ahead of what statements they've made on this. As you know, there's been a lot of pressure on Biogen to make this drug available to patients with SOD1 ALS uh, because of the devastating nature and the rapidly progressive nature of the disease. I mean, uh, simply put, um, they believe that this drug will be available to all patients with SOD1 ALS. That's the hope, of course. Um, in the near future. So they focused on those with rapidly progressing forms of disease because those patients may not make it to the time in which this drug is, is available for all patients with SOG1 ALS. Um, and, and quite simply, I think that's, that's the rationale behind it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> the next question is from Manny Furahar with SVB Leerink. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for the question. A couple quick ones. Um, I know it's been danced around on this call and others. Can you lay out for us whether or not we could expect potential exploratory cardiac measures from the NeuroTTR Transform study? One of your competitors has um, discussed at length exploratory cardiac measures from their polyneuropathy study. Um, and, failing that, and failing that, uh, from the cardiomyopathy side, can you give us a sense of what you are seeing in the marketplace as opposed to what you're seeing in a clinical trial execution setting around use of tofamidus alongside oligotherapy um, in patients with combined, um, with combined neuropathy and cardiomyopathy symptoms? Uh, sure, Manny. Um, I'll take the first one and I'll ask um, um, uh, Neza to talk a little bit about how we see the market playing out right now with um, RNA targeted therapies and tofamidism, but we're really probably more importantly how we see it playing out in the future. Um, yes, indeed, we have cardiac measures in the polyneuropathy um, uh, Epon Tersen phase three study. Um, these are secondary endpoints and, and maybe some exploratory endpoints as well. All the classic endpoints will be looked at um, for those patients with mixed phenotypes. Um, with cardiac involvement, so that'll be that'll include you know the, the ventricular load and the load buildup in the heart um, um, markers such as NT pro B and P um, and 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 other markers um, uh, in that study as we did in the tick study um, phase three study. Um, so be on the lookout for that <clears throat> next year when the data reads out, as well as of course the primary endpoints, which is MNIST plus seven. Um, and for the eight months, it's also TTR reductions, right, Richard? Yeah. yeah. And then as we bring this the study to its completion at 15 months, um, we'll also have quality of life as a primary 
pain point at that point. Um, I, I think Onasia might be the best one to, mm -hmm. to comment on the market for um, stabilizers and RNA targeted therapies. Yeah, happy to. Hi, Mani, how are you? Um, thanks for the question. So, um, yeah, we are seeing, so really your question is like, it, it's a geographical answer. So in the U.S., we're seeing um, some, you know, fair amount of use of, of tefamidus. Um, and, you know, again, they're doing a really good job of, you know, diagnosing and getting patients treated. Um, we've done um, some good work with KOLs and just, you know, good market research with clinicians who, who prescribe this, um, as well as payers. And, the sense we're getting um, from them is that you know, this is a really sick pop a population. These patients actually uh, really need care, and um, that they could see a world where um, we can easily use a silencer and a stabilizer together. Um, and um, I think, you know, mechanistically, of course, it would have been nice to have the silencer on us first. Um, but, you know, and that's not how the order of entry really worked out. But the market is large. Um, it's uh, a diverse. It's dynamic. And, and what I really, again, go back to what I like, what we're doing, is we're actually looking at the, at the future world and how it's evolving. And we will have a set of data for clinicians where they want to use this with or without a tefamidus in a wide and diverse um, patient population. Um, from a payer perspective, also we've seen uh, really no hesitation to to use these products alone or in combination as well. Again, going back to this is a very sick population, um, and uh, we need to do what's right for the patient here. Thanks, Anisa. Bonnie, did it. Thanks. I have one quick follow up. Yeah, I have one quick follow up. One, there's been a lot of discussion around the role of six minute walk. As, a, as an approvable endpoint in cardiomyopathy was a little different than the experience um, that Tefaminus Vindicale and Vindamax has had. Um, what's the, in, your, in your sort of commercial as well as clinical trial experience, what's the state of feedback you're getting from clinicians regarding their receptiveness to use therapies approved on a six-minute walk but without, uh, but without survival data in hand? And so how, do you, how, do you, how do you execute on that when you're launching against uh, an asset, an oral asset that does have a survival benefit of the label. And Aza, you want to run with that? Sure. Um, yeah, listen, I think, you know, again, um, you, you have to look at where the market is, and the market has survival data in there. So I think it's going to be really important to be able to deliver that, um, to effectively find a place for that new therapy that's coming on place in terms of what is the um, cardiovascular risk reduction. So I think it's going to be um, going to be and is claimed as a very important um, factor for making a decision for these patients. Um, that being said, you know we have as our secondary endpoint in our studies, um, you know, the functional improvements. Uh, yeah, they're important um, for patients, and six minute walk is a good functional improvement. But again, um, you know, in a market where things are already established with CVRR, I think it's going to be about that as well as how quickly you actually see the effect on patients because these patients do progress. And those are the two things that are coming up as, as really important for us. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, Nani, as you know, for the mixed phenotypes, the hereditary phenotypes, the cardiovascular, cardiomyopathy, and polyneuropathy, those six-minute walk tests are a little complicated because of the polyneuropathy component to the disease. So if you're improving polyneuropathy um, in the feet, um, you may be able to improve six-minute walk distance. that has nothing to do with improvements in cardiomyopathy. So it's a little complicated. We, 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 we really believe in we believe the outcome data will will um, <clears throat> drive the greatest by far value for these drugs um, when they when, when that's demonstrated. Great, thanks for the question, guys. The next question is from Miles Mintar with William Blair. Please go ahead. Uh, hey everyone, uh, just uh, a, a quick question on the MAPT data at ARC. Um, I noticed that particularly on the total tower levels, they seem to keep decreasing even though these patients have been off four months of drug um, or been off drug for four months. So I'm just wondering, 
um, how you're thinking or how Biogen may be thinking about dosing frequency and that particular indication as you move into a better powered phase two. And in the publication, will that include uh, CDI from the boxes, uh, you know, followed up for this long-term extension part? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is, as I said earlier, we think this is a, a great drug and duration of action is one of the things that we've been working hard on. And uh, so I think that continued tau reduction that's mentioned is, is evidence of, of, of that. And we hope to expand on that with, with the publication as, as we share more data on the program and, and really demonstrate that, that this is an outstanding looking molecule. And of course, we'll design our studies to support the optimal dosing schedule. And if you're doing intrathecal injection, fewer injections less frequently are, are a good thing. So, And the durability really is remarkable for the drug. Um, you know, it, it probably supports um, biannual dosing potentially. Not that that is um, um, necessarily the dosing regimen for the phase two study, but certainly the data um, supports that. And as Eric said, it's a reflection of the continued improvements we're making, not just in the drugs we identify in neuro, but across the board. And then um, just was the CDR sum of the boxes, is that something that will be included in the publication or was that only measured as baseline to screen these patients in? Thanks. Um, I don't think we have visibility. We, we know yet whether or not the long-term extension will be in the, in the publication. Typically, when we publish first in, in patient studies, it's just the randomized portion of the study, and then the long-term extensions will be um, presented at medical meetings to follow and those sorts of things, and maybe publications as well. Uh, don't have a, a definitive answer for that question, Miles. No worries. Thanks for the question. Thank you. The next question is from Esther Rajavalu with UBS. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Um, on Fuse ALS, can you help us understand some of the trial design uh, considerations for this phase three that you're starting to enroll compared to Tifersin? And then I have a follow-up on another topic. Richard, you want to take that? Sure. This is fun. Yes. Um, so it's similar in terms of the design uh, and the regimen. And so uh, it is a phase three registrational study. So it's not, um, it's, it's moving directly from uh, what has been an open label um, single patient or a few patients being uh, treated to a full registration with um, all the health authority input, uh, with the design, and et cetera. So um, I, I think in terms of um, where we are with FUS, we're very confident that the, the design that we put together is one uh, that will be supportive of this, again, uh, a very good drug uh, moving into phase three. And we're excited that the program has started and patients are enrolling. And to add to that, Esther, um, the primary endpoint is the same as the Toperson, so there's a direct link there, um, the ALS functional rating scale. Um, obviously, we, we have the ability to measure um, uh, target engagement in, in patients too, like we did with the Toperson study. <clears throat> and um, so it's, it's quite similar. It's, it's a longer study um, than, than the six-month Toperson study. It's like 250 almost a year, I think, treatment, right, in the phase. Yeah. Right, I think it's 272 days or something. So is it the, the longer duration of treatment, that is, is that specific to this patient phenotype, or what's, um, what's the thought behind that? ALS is a rapidly progressing neurodegenerative diseases, but there are certain forms of ALS that are more rapidly progressing than others. FUS is, is, a, is it sort of your... Um, your normal, if you will, if you want to use that word, um, progressing patient population for ALS. So it takes a little longer, and um, uh, therefore the study is longer. 
Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a quick follow-up on the transferrin receptor question that was asked earlier. Um, you referred to cardiac indications, but can you maybe help us understand whether you're referring to cardiometabolic indications or more uh, tied to the structural issues in, in the heart? Oh, we're focused on diseases like heart failure. Um, targeting cardiac myocytes directly, not, not metabolic or, or those sorts of things. We're going after um, uh, well-validated targets based on genetics, as well as um, validation, tar validated targets based on preclinical data that we've generated um, and others have generated, um, targeting directly um, cardiac myocytes. So different forms of heart failure um, is our primary focus there. Understood. Thank you very much. The next question is from David Leibowitz with um, Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, when, when you look forward to the uh, side one readout, could you just run us through what we could expect to see in that readout, uh, what you think needs to be achieved um, as far as uh, being able to exceed regulatory thresholds, um, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure, David. Um, so, um, obviously, uh, this is a randomized placebo-controlled um, six-month trial, Tofacin placebo versus placebo, primary endpoint ALS functional rating scale. That's where the focus is, is to demonstrate statistically significant clinical benefit to patients on drug versus um, placebo. Um, there'll also be quite a bit of supportive long-term extension data from that study as well. Um, <clears throat> we do not believe that SOD1 reduction, the biomarker, will be sufficient um, for an approval by itself. With that said, there's enormous outcry for this drug today by the, by the ALS community. Um, this is a... Um, a, a very active um, um, patient um, community that has um, cried out for, as, as we touched on earlier in the compassionate use study that Biogen opened up, cried out for this drug a long time ago to get access to it. There are no treatments for this disease, and it's a severely, it's a severe neurodegenerative disease, as you know. So, you know, th that's what we're looking for. That's what we're feeling confident about based on the phase two data and, and the fact that we're targeting the genetic, the known cause of this disease. But um, there are no treatments for this disease. So, you know, um, there, I, I do believe that regulators will be open-minded on trying to deliver a drug like this to patients as rapidly as possible. Thank you very much for taking the question. Thank you, David. And I think that that's our last question. Um, so yes. with that, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us uh, on our call today. Um, we have a lot of momentum going into the second half of the year. And as the year unfolds, we're really looking forward to providing further updates as we continue to execute on, on all of our goals. So until then, thanks for joining us today and, and have a great day. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.